Morning Harvest. Psalm 59. Let's start with a little uh, Leo Tolstoy quote. Tolstoy said, music is the shorthand of emotion. Music is the shorthand of emotion. Through song, we express what could not be said any other way. Uh, we've just done that over the last few minutes as we've uh, lift our voice, lifted our voices together in, in the worship of our God. And God made us this way. He, he made us as emotive beings. Uh, we feel we feel deeply as human beings. Um, on Friday, um, when I do the, the, the bulk of the writing for the sermons, I spend the entire day uh, just working on this. And I didn't have a particularly good Friday morning. It wasn't going well. I was reading. I was gathering thoughts. But nothing was coming together in terms of the writing. And I was getting a little frustrated uh, by that. And so I turned on Spotify to throw back tunes 70s, and I started, I started, you don't know whether to laugh at that or not, so um, I like 70s rock, I like 70s pop, and um, I, the reason, and all of a sudden, the message started to come together, that's where that was going, um, but in that playlist of 70s music, and if you don't like 70s music, I feel sorry for you. Um, mostly. Um, but in that playlist, you, you, you hear so much emotion in 70s music. You hear so much joy and so much fun and lots of celebration. You certainly have all of that. But there's also a lot of real life pain and, and heartache and struggle in that music. And uh, maybe, maybe 70s uh, rock and pop is not your jam, and that's that's fine. Maybe you have a different jam. I have no issue with that unless it's country music. But uh, <laughs> can I get an amen? amen? Thank you. We all have different styles, different tastes, different genres of music that we like. And would it surprise you to know that the Psalms themselves, which is the songbook of the Bible, these 150 songs that we have, that there are different uh, types of Psalms. We have, in fact, categories of psalms. There are some that are uh, outright praise psalms, and the, the entire song is just about praising God. Uh, there are uh, psalms that are psalms of thanksgiving, fairly self-explanatory. They just rehearse all the good things God has given to us and thank Him for it. There are uh, uh, psalms that are called trust psalms. And, curiously, the largest single category of psalms that we have, the largest number of psalms among the 150, are lament psalms. It's like God is saying to us, by giving us, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, giving us this songbook, it's like God is saying to us, it's okay to emote, it's okay to grieve, it's okay to call out in anguish, it's, it's even okay to rage a bit. Uh, David Barker, who spoke the first message in this series, and he wrote the book that's an inspiration for this series, he wrote this, life is hard, and the scriptures give us voice to come to our God boldly and openly to express our pain, frustration, despair, and even anger. Now, last week, and this is important because in this series, we're looking at narratives and we're looking at songs that were written out of the narratives. And last week, we looked at the narrative of a very tough situation for David in 1 Samuel chapter 19. And now we turn to the song that was written about that account in Psalm 59. The song written about this situation, filled with such despair. But also, we'll see, it's filled with a deeper worship of God. And that's what we should want. Even as we've gathered here today, the, the heart's desire for each one of us should be a deeper experience of worshiping God, no matter what we're going through in life. We've got to lock that in. A deeper experience of worshiping God, no matter what we're going through in life. In fact, that that despairing troubles in our lives would actually drive us and compel us toward deeper and greater adoration of our God. And again, that's what we're going to find in Psalm 59. So if you have your Bibles open, 
Follow along as I read Psalm 59. Deliver me from my enemies, O God. Protect me from those who rise up against me. Deliver me from those who work evil. And save me from bloodthirsty men. For behold, they lie in wait for my life. Fierce men stir up strife against me. For no transgression or sin of mine, O Lord, for no fault of mine, they run and make ready. Awake, come to meet me and see. You, Lord God of hosts, are God of Israel. Rouse yourself to punish all the nations. Spare none of those who treacherously plot evil. Each evening they come back, howling like dogs and prowling about the city. There they are, bellowing with their mouths, with swords in their lips, for who they think will hear us. But you, O Lord, laugh at them. You hold all the nations in derision. O my strength, I will watch for you, for you, O God, are my fortress. My God, in his steadfast love, will meet me. God will let me look in triumph on my enemies. Kill them not, lest my people forget. Make them totter by your power and bring them down, O Lord, our shield. For the sin of their mouths, the works of their lips, let them be trapped in their pride. For the cursing and lies that they utter, consume them in wrath. Consume them till they are no more, that they may know that God rules over Jacob to the ends of the earth. Each evening they come back, howling like dogs and prowling about the city. They wander about for food and growl if they do not get their fill. But I will sing of your strength. I will sing aloud of your steadfast love in the morning. For you have been to me a fortress and a refuge in the day of my distress. O oh, my strength, I will sing praises to you. For you, O oh God, are my fortress. The God who shows me steadfast love. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, this is what we're going after here. It's a declaration. In fact, we're going to make five declarations off of this phrase. I will worship God in the midst of despair with, first of all, first declaration, an unashamed plea for help. An unashamed plea for help. Maybe as you've been reading the Psalms, uh, you notice that there are these words in the ESV translation, which we use. It's in all caps, and it's just before verse 1. And um, we don't have uh, this for every psalm, but quite a number of psalms have this. And it gives us a little bit of context about the song itself. This is the ascription. And notice in this psalm, it is written, this song is written to the choir master. So it's meant for gathered worship. And it says that it is according to do not destroy, which uh, the speculation is this is the tune that it was to be sung to, uh, likely a 70s rock ballad. <laughs> it is called a miktam. That's a musical note of some sort in the Hebrew. We don't exactly know what it means. It's possibly the style that it was to be uh, sung in. And we notice also that it is a psalm of David. And that means that either David composed it or it was done in a Davidic style. It was done based on a Davidic story uh, written by someone else. The occasion here we know is 1 Samuel 19 was when Saul sent men to watch his house in order to kill him. Now, right away in verses 1 and 2, with that description in mind, David fires off four imperatives to, to express what he needs of God. If you remember back to grammar class, imperatives come with the force of a command. And so he commands God, can you imagine now, David going before the Lord in prayer, and he's commanding, he's commanding God to, first of all, verse 1, deliver me from my enemies, O God. And then in case God didn't hear him, he's going to give him the same command, but just with slightly different words, protect me from those who rise up against me. He says a third time, in case God hasn't gotten it, verse 2, deliver me from those who work evil. And for good measure, a fourth time, he says... Save me from bloodthirsty men. Four times. And as I'm reading that, going to God with four commands that are all exactly the same as if he didn't hear you the first time, seems a bit presumptuous. And I'm a little afraid for David at this point. Because I'm not sure I would go to God commanding him to do anything. And yet here's David doing it. Offering us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit this song written 
expressing his heart to God. And God allows us to hear this song, granting us, in fact, permission to speak to him in this way. And so mostly as I read this now, it's love and appreciation for David having done it, that he's so unashamed to call on God in this way. And as I was looking at this, in fact, I, I thought about a quote from Timothy Keller. It, it goes like this, the only person who dares wake up a king, who dares wake up a king at 3 a.m. for a glass of water is a child. And Keller makes the point that we have that kind of access. No one else would go to the king and wake them up at 3 a.m. for a glass of water, but a child would. Because we know this about our God. Yes, he's transcendent. He's so completely other than us. We know that he is omnipotent and omniscient and omnipresent, all present, all powerful, and, and all knowing. We know that about our God. But we also know, as Jordan said at the start of the service, we also know he's the friend of sinners, don't we? We also know He's invited us into relationship and, and to have access with Him. We know that He is a Father who loves His sons and daughters, and he's, he's actually invited us as our Father to go to Him at 3 a.m. and to simply ask Him for a glass of water. And so we know we owe Him our devotion and our honor and our worship as the transcendent God, but we also know we can come to Him at any time and with anything. And the message in this is simple. If you're in trouble, call out to him. If you've come here today and you're under the weight of distress, if you're despairing of some situation in your life, call out to him. If, if, if enemies are coming against you, sickness, grief, addiction, contention in relationships, temptation, take it to God, plead with him four times if you need to. He'll hear your prayer. He'll receive your worship. In the book of Hebrews, a sermon, the preacher says this in Hebrews 4.16. He says, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Don't hold back. Plead for help if you need it. Here's a second declaration. Worship God with an unburdened conscience. David was confident that what he was facing was, was unjust. So, sometimes we hold back from going to God because we go, I'm too sinful. I have this going on in my life. I don't believe that God um, will hear my prayer. I don't believe that I should even um, go to God in prayer given the status of my life, given how weak I am, how fragile I am how much sin I might have in my life. David, David isn't coming with that kind of an attitude. Now, David was a sinner, of course. We know that David was a sinner. David's a sinner, we're sinners. The difference between us and David is our sins are not going to be recorded in the Holy Scriptures for all of history to read. And we can be grateful for that. Thanks, David, for taking one for the team. But you read in the scriptures of David's sins. We know that David was a sinner. We know that we're sinners. But in this case, in this particular situation, with this enemy bearing down on him, he had done nothing wrong to merit the persecution or to warrant the death sentence that had been placed on his head. And so he says in verse 3, notice, they lie in wait for me. These fierce men stir up strife against me. They're talking smack about me. Okay, They're coming after me with false accusations. None of what they're saying is true. He says, for no transgression or sin of mine. I've not done anything to merit this. Verse 4, for no fault of mine. My conscience is clear, David says. But... They run and make ready. They're coming for me nonetheless. Now, a theological note on this point, because there are times that trials come into our lives that are the result of sin, and God is indeed bringing those trials to affect discipline in our lives and to pull us back to himself. We're rebellious. God sends a trial in our life. 
We're to see that as his discipline and repent and turn back to him. That is a legitimate way that God works in the world, and we have many examples of that in the scriptures. But that is not what is happening here. Trials are not always the result of sin. Sometimes trials are given so that God might be glorified in our lives. And that's the case with David here. So David's calling out to God. He's worshiping him. His conscience is clear. He knows that this is an injustice that he is facing. And yet, from his earthbound perspective, and again, this is the beauty of the Psalms. You read the rest of the Bible, and it is God's word to us, God speaking to us. But the 150 Psalms that we have in the songbook of the Bible is our heart being expressed to Him. And God allows us this latitude. And David, full of emotion, from his earthbound perspective, says, God It seems like you don't even care about my situation. It seems like you're not engaged at all in what's happening here. In fact, from my perspective, it looks like you're sleeping on the job. Because what does he say next? Awake! Verse 4, he says, awake, God! God, wake up! Now, God doesn't sleep. Psalm 121, verse 4, you can write down that reference. God doesn't sleep, neither does he slumber. But again, we're working from our human, earthly perspective on all of that. We can only see what we can see. It's very limited perspective. We can't see the end the way the Lord sees it. We can't see the process that God is going through for his own purposes to bring us to that end point. And so what we have from David is this emotional outpouring that God permits David calling out to him, notice here, come to me and see, come and see what's going on. Because I fear that you're not seeing the danger I'm in. And even at that moment, even while he's being very raw and very emotional with God and pouring it out and letting God exactly know exactly how he feels about it, he then turns it back to the theology that he knows is true. Verse 5. You, Lord God of hosts, very militaristic language. He's the the God, the king over the armies of heaven. You, Lord God of hosts, are God of Israel. Again, he comes back to the same idea. Awake, rouse yourself to punish all the nations. Spare none of those who treacherously plot evil. And then you see the word. If you're looking at the text right now, you see the word, Selah. You see that word there? Another Hebrew word, another musical notation. We have no idea what this word means. A lot of people suggest that it just means rest, but it could mean forte. It could mean pianissimo. I'm exhausting all of the musical terms that I know right now. It could mean electric guitar solo. That's what it could mean. It could mean loud crashing cymbals at this point. We don't know what Selah means, but it could be any one of these things. It's some musical notation. And obviously it marks a transition in the song. Now, by the way, this is also where we see the song deviate a little bit from the narrative, from the precision of the narrative back in 1 Samuel 19. Because now we see it's not only about David's situation with Saul, which was the context of the narrative, but now it's also about the nations. It's about Israel and its enemies, the nations. Likely the song was first inspired by 1 Samuel 19 and then was expanded for congregational use in in Israel. And and so other enemies were included in the storyline of the song and the lyrics. And in fact... That's one of the reasons why we can look at this and go, yes, it was inspired by this, and then it applied to this, and then we think of it in terms of our own context and how we're interpreting it for ourselves today. Ultimately, this psalm points forward to the ultimate victory that we all experience when Christ returns and restores that which was lost to us. The victory, of course, that was first uh, gained for us at Calvary with Christ on the cross. Speaking about the Psalms as a whole, 
Chad Bird said this, the voyage through every psalm is incomplete until it harbors in Christ. He is always the destination as well as the origin and the way. Now, ultimately, we can only have, we're talking about having a clear conscience in worship. And ultimately, we can only have a clear conscience in worship. Not because we keep ourselves morally right, because we always choose what's good and godly. But ultimately, we can have a clear conscience in worship because of what Jesus Christ did for us. His sacrifice. And we only have hope of vindication over our enemies. We only have hope of righting injustices because Jesus triumphantly rose from the dead. That is our, where our confidence rests. Now, David was saved by the same confidence that we have, only David didn't know any of that. David didn't know about Christ and what he was going to do for, uh, for the salvation of the world. But David was no less saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. David was no less vindicated by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That for him and that for us is the only source of having your conscience clear, of having your sins forgiven, of having the obstacle that is between us and God removed. This is the reason why, to, to go back to Hebrews 4.16, this is the reason why we can, with confidence, come before the throne of grace. It's because in that same, in, in that same section of Hebrews 4, the preacher told us in verse 14 to hold fast our confession, namely that Jesus Christ himself, verse 15, was without sin and thus was the one and only perfect sacrifice for sin, for our sin. And in chapter 10 of Hebrews 10, 10, he said this, we have been sanctified or saved, made holy. We have been made holy. Our conscience is cleared through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. That, if you've not done that, if you've not come to Jesus Christ, have your conscience cleared, to have your sins forgiven, that is what you must do today. And that clearing of our conscience, that compels our worship of God. Here's a third declaration. I'll worship with a full grasp of the enemy. We have to know who or what we're fighting. Does anybody uh, here know the name uh, Sun Tzu? Anybody know that name, Sun Tzu? Any military people? There's a few people here who know Sun Tzu. He wrote the classic book, um, The Art of War. Here's what Sun Tzu said, and this applies to every Christian. Like this is, you, you can read this and go, this is biblical. If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer defeat. And if you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you'll succumb in every battle. He's got it. Like that's spot on to the spiritual warfare that we find ourselves in as Christians. And when we come to this, how do we understand who our enemy is? What happens in the song here is that the enemy, the description of the enemy is the chorus of the song. And it's going to repeat twice in the song. In verses 6 and 7 and 14 and 15, this is the refrain that describes the enemies of David with pretty vivid language. We find out that they are nocturnal hunters. Verse 6, each evening they come back howling like dogs and prowling about the city. Now listen, when you see dogs in the Bible, you've heard me say this before. If you've been around any length of time, you know this. When you see dogs in the Bible, do not think your beloved pet who's got the chip and goes to the vet and you feed the best food and you take on walks and is a part of your fur family. You know, that's not what we're talking about here. I don't have a dog, can you tell? That's not what you think. When you see dogs in the Bible, think mangy mutts, they're wild, they're filthy, they're considered unclean animals, people didn't have them as pets, they were not esteemed creatures. 
Okay, that's why this metaphor works here for the enemies. Each evening they come back howling like dogs. We don't like dogs. And prowling about the city. Verse 7, there they are, bellowing with their mouths, with swords in their lips. This is a menacing picture in this chorus. These dogs are the alpha predators of the night. And they're stalking their prey. And in this case, for David, it's the, it's the soldiers of Saul that have come to kill him. You see it again in verse 14. This is the second chorus. Each evening they come, howling like dogs, prowling about the city. But notice, now in verse 15, the chorus changes. They wander about for food, and they growl if they do not get their fill. By the end of this song, they're no longer the alpha predators. But now they've been relegated to scavengers because God has turned the table on them. Now, David uses this metaphor to cast his enemies in a certain light. And again, when we're studying the Scriptures, we, we want to be able to read this and understand how it applies to us today. And so, who are our enemies is the question. And could I mention first, who are not our enemies? Could I mention that first? It's a question. You have to answer it. <laughs> this is going to be the good part. Maybe that's why you didn't answer. You don't maybe want to hear this. Because I think as Christians and as a church, not necessarily our church, but speaking broadly of the church, we have become distracted. And far too many Christians and far too many churches have fallen off of the gospel centrality that is necessary for us to see exactly who we're fighting as Christians today. Many have engaged in battles that are not targeting our true enemy. If your eyes are on the world, if you're more preoccupied by the politics of this day than you are with the Great Commission, if you can spout off a political talking points and policy, but you can't quote Scripture, then that's a problem. You're susceptible to misidentifying the enemy. So let me give you three examples. Three examples of of enemies that some Christians have identified as the enemy that are not our enemy. And some of you will be mad at me after this, and you will not come back to this church, and I will say, that is fine. (laughs) Number one, government is not the enemy. And by government, I mean the people that are in the government, not the system, but the people who are in the government, the presidents and prime ministers, the cabinet ministers, and the members of parliament or Congress or senators, whatever you want, government, the people of the government are not the enemies. No matter how left-leaning they are, no matter how extreme right they are, they are not the enemy. Just think of this in the first century context of the church. Just think of the apostles going about and preaching the gospel around the Roman Empire. Just, to, just think about the fact that, that, that Caesar was persecuting them. That they would be beaten for their faith, for the preaching of the gospel. That some would be thrown to lions. That some would be crucified on roadsides. That some would be uh, pinned to stakes and burned alive for their faith. And not once, not once do we read that Christians thought that Caesar was the enemy. Not once. Government is not the enemy. Here's a second one. The LGBTQ plus community is not the enemy. No matter how much their lifestyle assaults the biblical understanding of the image of God in us as human beings, no matter how much this violates God's moral standard for sexuality and gender, that community is not the enemy. Here's a third one. The medical community engaged in medical assistance in dying and in abortion are not the enemy. Yes, it is a heartbreaking reality and tragedy of our time. Yes, it is reprehensible. Yes, it is a modern holocaust. Yes, it is shameful that our country has no law surrounding abortion. It's shameful. The most shameful thing, I believe, for us as Canadians is that we have no abortion law whatsoever. 
But those having abortions, those performing abortions, those facilitating and advocating for abortions and for medical assistance in dying are not the enemy. Do you want to know who the enemy is? Let me say, first of all, that we are engaged in one war, and we have been in war since the Garden. The moment that humanity caved to the serpent and sin fell upon us, and that sin has been imputed to every single human being, from that moment until now, we have been at war. It is one war, and it is one war being fought against one enemy, but he is fighting this war on three fronts. The first of those fronts is the world, as in the world system, not the people, and it's a very important distinction. This is the world system, not the people, but it is the machine of this world that people, in fact, are victims of. It is the machine of the economic system that enslaves so many people in the world and benefits so few people. It is the sports industry at all levels that consumes our time and preoccupies us and takes us away from the things that are truly important. It is the rabbit hole of the internet that sucks us in to its darkness so subtly. It is the entertainment industry that titillates and draws in and influences and ruins the mind and ruins the heart. It is the political systems that no one now, no person can change or control. And it is the educational system that indoctrinates. In fact, it is everything that sucks us into the vortex of ungodliness and away from the worship of the one true God. That is one front in the war that we are fighting. And the world system is indeed our enemy. Here's the second one. The flesh. Our own flesh. Our own our own bodies. And, and to be honest with you, this is the biggest battle. You know, like I, I've been walking with Jesus for a long time, so I feel like in a lot of ways, I'm not saying I'm not influenced by the world and I don't cave into it for uh, one, once in a while, for sure I do. But I feel like for the most part, I have perspective on the world system and I have it at bay. And we're going to talk in a few minutes about the third front. And I feel like that's not an issue for me really at all. But this one right here, this is a big deal. This battle that I'm fighting against my own flesh every single day. And please just give me an indication right now that it's not just me, but it's you too. That this is where your real battle is. You know, there's this old cartoon, I think it was a comic strip, that said that we have met the enemy and the enemy is us. I have met the enemy. And the enemy is me. This is the biggest, I, this is the biggest battle I have. This is the toughest foe that I face when it comes to living a holy life. Think about it. How many of these things have we caved into just in the last few days? Greed, lust, jealousy, disdain, indifference, selfishness, deceit, and gossip. A small sampling. I remember having a list at one time, I'm sure I could dig it up, of 80 sins. I gave you, what, eight here. This is a battle. What it, is, what it really is, is it's a battle, since we're talking about worship here, it's really a battle that am I going to worship God, am I going to worship myself, and I become my own God. And that's when I start to lose the battle. Here's the third, the world, the flesh, the third one is the devil himself. Any overt expressions of evil the occult, seances, tarot cards, Ouija boards, horoscopes, astrology, fortune-telling, witchcraft, and crystals. 
The demons are actively engaged in spiritual warfare that is um, often more apparent in non-Western settings. I've said before that the work of the devil in, in the direct work, the direct uh, work of evil in our world today in the Western world tends to be more covert and the work of the devil in other parts of the world tends to be more overt, more obvious, more out in the open. And people, Christians, are more aware of it in other parts of the world. And we tend to have our head in the sand about it. We should not be naive as to the work of the evil one here and his demons. These enemies, the, the world, the flesh, and the devil, these can cause despair to us. The other so-called enemies that we were talking about, government officials and the gay and trans community and, and the medical community, they're not our enemies. They shouldn't cause us despair. We should grieve what's happening in the world. But we shouldn't despair. What we've tried to lock down is who our true enemies are. And if we're going to win these battles then we have to know who we are and we have to know who our enemy is. And people, no matter how far they are from God, no matter what atrocities they're committing, no matter what, what words they're speaking, no matter how much vitriol they cast at the church, no matter how many people they are leading astray, every single one of those people is a lost soul in need of Jesus Christ. Do you agree with that? They need Jesus. They need Christ. And you and I as the followers of Christ, those who have received the gift of salvation, we should be the first to be praying for them. We should be the first to be showing genuine love, care, and concern for them. And they should be the target, not of our attacks, not of our vitriol. But they should be the target of our witness and the sharing of the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. I doubt we'll be able to worship very well at all if we haven't figured out who our enemy really is. Here's a fourth declaration. You still with me? Everybody still good? I'll also worship with a complete confidence in his plan. Verses 8 through 13, we have some pretty harsh language. It's an imprecatory. The, the word we put on this is an imprecatory section. And to, to, um, to pray imprecations is to uh, pray in such a way that you're calling on God to bring down His wrath and His judgment on His enemies. Now, when studying Psalms, the Psalms, when really studying any of the Old Testament, one of the things we have to do, and one of the questions we always ask in our interpretation of the Bible, this is a question you should all be asking, is what did the original author intend for the original audience? And that original audience is going to be receiving what the author wrote in the historical context, the historic context that they find themselves. And so when we come to the Old Testament, we need to be asking that question. What did the author intend for that audience and what was going on in the world at the time? And once we have discovered that and, and distilled out from that, not the particulars, but the principle that can now be bridged forward into our day, that's what I want. I want the principle out of that situation. And that's what we need to have in mind when we look at this imprecation that is spoken here. We have to remember that, that, in, that Old Testament Israel was a theocracy, which is the word for a country that is under the direct rule of God. Israel is the only theocracy to have ever existed and, and it's very important for us when we're, when we're reading the Old Testament is that we can't separate the nation from, from their faith and their religion. Separating national Israel from their religion was impossible. For Israel, it is one and the same. In fact, when you look at the first five books of the Bible, what they call the Torah, and specifically the book of Leviticus, 
The book of Leviticus is not just a religious document. The book of Leviticus is a governing document for a country. And so in that respect, when you have this in mind, that, it, that, that these documents govern the country, but also the faith of the country, and you see these things as inseparable, then you begin to understand a little bit more clearly that there is a call here for the destruction of people. So notwithstanding everything I just said, that people are not the enemy, in Old Testament times, it was indeed that because you can't separate the country from the faith. Calling for the destruction of Israel's enemies here in this imprecation was appropriate because they were opposing God's representative nation on earth. And side note, important to say this, again, there are no other theocracies in history. There is no theocracy today. The United States of America, despite what some American Christians and American nationalists might say, Christian nationalists might say, Christian nationalists, they use our word, the United States is not a theocracy. It is not under God. It is not a special favored nation in God's redemptive plan. Okay? That needed to be said. I can pause for anybody to walk out if you want to. It's fine. But in light of all of that, David is expressing his confidence, something that we can certainly emulate as this is going on in his life. Verse 8, laugh at them. You laugh at them, God. You laugh at them. You hold all the nations in derision. He's kind of looking down on this situation that we think is so dire, so grave, and God's just laughing at it because God is the God of the universe, and he made all this, and this is like a plaything to him. They have nothing on you, David is saying. David knows who his God is. Verse 9, he says, oh, my strength, I will watch for you, for you, O oh God, are my fortress. He's expressing his confidence. He's not expressing his inner strength. He's not expressing his own ingenuity. He's not expressing his own determination. He's not calling on his friend group. He's not relying on the armies of Israel to come to his rescue. God, that's it. And he sings out, verse 10, my God in his steadfast love will meet me. He's singing this at the top of his lungs. God will let me look in triumph on my enemies. Think Satan. Think the world. Think your own flesh. God will meet me in his steadfast love. God will let me triumph over my enemies. Then he says, surprisingly, verse 11, kill them not. Don't kill them. Just hold back. Don't wipe them out all at once. Could you just make it a slow burn? I don't want people to forget, he says in verse 11. I want you to make them totter by your power and, and then bring them down, O Lord, our shield. Make it, make it really hard. Make it obvious to everyone so that everyone knows, Israel and the whole world knows who you are. Verse 12, for the sin of their mouths, the words of their lips, let, it be, let them be trapped in their pride for the cursing and lies that they utter. Consume them in wrath. Consume them till they are no more that they may know. There is in this, this evangelistic zeal, this desire to make sure that this is about the worship of God, that God rules over Jacob, that everyone knows that God rules over Jacob or Israel. And that that word is spread to the ends of the earth. And then you see the word Selah. And when I read that, I go, that can't be rest. That has to be electric guitar solo. Because <laughs> it's a dramatic moment. Who's resting at this point? And we need this. I mean, some of you came here today, and it was hard to come here today. And you've had a terrible week, a terrible month, and a terrible year. Some of you, it's not even that terrible. You just feel weak with all that life is throwing at you right now. And, and I saw this tweet, if you wake up feeling fragile, remember that God is not. And then trust Him to be everything you need today. Have that confidence in Him. That confidence, that's worship. Worship isn't just what we do here on Sunday mornings. That confidence of living in Him is an act of worship on Tuesdays and Thursdays and Saturday mornings as much as it is when you get here on Sunday morning. 
And then in all of this, that's four declarations. We've got one more to go. And we're coming right up to, wait, I, I remember another music word. We come right to the crescendo right now. Okay. I will worship God in the midst of despair with a full-throated song of praise. Now, when David composes these lyrics, the outcome for him is still uncertain. I mean, he has the assurance that he's going to be the king because he'd been anointed by God, yet even that, from his perspective, he's not so sure. He doesn't know the end of the story. Sure, Samuel came in, the prophet anointed him with oil. Everybody saw it. He's been declared to be the next king, but Saul's do, still doing that. And now Saul's trying to kill him. And David can be forgiven here for maybe having some doubts and thinking, God, did, did I mess up or did Samuel mess up? Or like, what's really happening here? Because if I got anointed as king, why am I on the run and why am I hiding out? Why am I a refugee in my own country? Why is the king trying to kill me? Maybe we all just mid misread the situation. He can be forgiven for being fearful and wondering what might have gone wrong. But despite the crush of emotion and the very real threat to his life, David praises God. It's a full-throated. This is the way the, the, the song ends, and it's, it, it ends with this crescendo. A full-throated song of praise. In this psalm, we've been given permission to be human and to cry out to God. But what we are not given permission to do, David does not model for us in any way. What we are not given permission to do is to shut down our worship. To close him off from our lives. To stop being part of the faith community. That's a temptation, isn't it? I thought God was going to bless me. My life has been hard. I came to faith in Christ. Why isn't it perfect? Why isn't it better? Why is my life hard? Why am I despairing? Why this trial? Why this loss? Why am I not just experiencing the blessings? And you just go, it's not working for me. And so you first decide just not to come every week and not to be involved and not to be with God's people. And we're never given permission to do that. Your life will not be better by walking away from God in the midst of a hard time. I mean, do you think David's life, let's, let's go back. Would David's life have been better if he had walked away? Would he have been in a better situation if, if he had said, hey, look, God, that whole thing with Samuel, you had him come, he anointed me with oil, you said I was going to be the king, and then it's obviously not working out, so I just want to let you know, I'm out. Would that have been better for David to do that? Would David's life have been better if he had done that? No. And David knows that. David, David says, the dogs are howling, and they're prowling, and they're coming for me, verse 16. But I will sing of your strength. I will sing aloud of your steadfast love in the morning. For you have been to me a fortress and a refuge in the day of my distress. David's saying, I don't have anything other than you. Verse 17, oh, my strength, I will sing praises to you, for you, O oh God, are my fortress, the God who shows me steadfast love. That's worship. That's saying to God, you're worthy even when it's hard. You are worthy, especially when I'm despairing of my situation. Alan Redpath, who wrote a book on David's life, he, he said this in commenting on this psalm. He said, you have to put Jesus between you and your situation. You have to put Jesus between you and the enemy. And then he said this. Sing. Put Jesus 
between you and your enemy. And then sing.